And uh, good evening to you all, those of you who are in Guyana, in the wider Caribbean, in North America. It's still evening there. Good evening to you, those of you who are in Europe. It's good night or good morning because it's um, a couple of minutes past midnight in England, and I suppose it's the same time zone there in France. Good night, good morning to you all. Those of you who are joining us from the South American continent, uh, uh, good evening to you too. Um, welcome to uh, this evening's edition of Politics 101. I want to thank all of you who tuned in last night to the program, the interview with Aubrey Norton and the leader of the opposition, and got a lot of feedback from, from uh, quite a few of you, uh, a lot of feedback, and thank you all. Keep the feedback uh, coming because it's important that we know how we are doing and uh, uh, whether we are connecting with you, the audience, without you in the audience, um, we don't have a program. So please um, share the link as usual. We're on tonight. As we announced last night, we are gonna be continuing the conversation we started last week on race, ethnicity, and politics with Brother Vincent Alexander. Vincent, as we promised, is back today. And he's joined by Takuma Ogunse. They're both backstage and are ready uh, to roll. So please, um, please, please share the link and let everybody know that um, we are here and we are ready uh, to go. Good evening to all you regulars who are already here. Denise Booker, forever. Um, Lauren Jones, Valdin Kendall. Um, Valdin, I haven't spotted you in a long time, but you are, you are here. Welcome to uh, all of you. Um, and I am very glad that uh, you all were satisfied with the interview last night with Aubrey Norton. Got some of your questions answered. Each uh, audience, we appreciate uh, has its own emphasis. And, and, and even some of you who are part, part of all the audiences in that you check out all the shows. Uh, and I realize that, that people who are here, they leave, they go um, to Sherry Duncan and then Mark Benshop late in the night, Kedak in the morning. And uh, um, other programs, Rickford Bork, Norman Brown, um, Paul Slow and all the other programs. And each program does it its own particular way. And uh, um, Norton, of course, has appeared on all of these programs, my understanding is. And uh, um, of course, our program brought its own emphasis. Glad you all uh, were on and uh, that you all participated. Please, please share the link. Good evening, good evening to all of you. Tomorrow night, we are going to get a little bit in depth on the Venezuelan issue. We are going to have uh, Professor uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Curtin, Dr. Dr. Mark Curtin, we're gonna have on. He's an expert in Latin American politics. Just uh, published a book on Brazil, Guyana relations. So he is quite knowledgeable on the politics of that region. And he's going to be on tomorrow night to have his perspective on uh, the Venezuela-Guyana situation, which seems to be escalating, not in terms of any actual um, invasion or threats of invasion, um, but it's the kind of public discourse um, that we're having. Many people believe that the Guyanese population is not yet fully aware of the implications of what the Venezuelans are doing. Um, and a lot of people put it down to 
the fact that the government seems to be treating the issue relatively lightly. And secondly, to the fact that, uh, you know, this age of, uh, age of social media, you know, we are, we are into politics on a daily basis and we get very occupied with the local politics and sometimes do not focus enough on regional politics or, or politics that are driven by issues outside of the border, outside of our border. So, um, but, 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 but I, 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 I get the sense that uh, our people are, are beginning to pay attention to the implications of what's happening. Um, as you, those of you who were on last night knows that my thesis is I don't think the Venezuelans are walking across the border uh, tomorrow uh, and, and seize our land or um, declare war on us in an actual way. But I think the Venezuelans are taking a keen look at both the domestic developments the regional developments, the international developments, and they're making an assessment that perhaps now is the time to get something out of Guyana. I don't think they expect to walk in and get two thirds of our of our um, of our territory, but I think they feel that they can they can get something out of Guyana, given all the factors. I, I'm very clear in my mind that the PPP on these issues is very wobbly because it's a, it's a, it's a party that is concerned more about its political survival. It's concerned more about um, its, uh, the, the ethnic... Um, dynamics inside of Guyana. And so they've always been very weak on foreign policy. They've always been very weak on regional issues. You know, you go back to the Federation, the fact that they did not take Guyana into the West Indies Federation for ethnic reasons, ethnic reasons. And you come right through. I mean, uh, these days they are um, friendly, friendly with CARICOM, but the PPP has historically not, not, not a fan of CARICOM, not a fan of regional integration. You know, there was a time when they paid much more attention to a proposed sub-regional integration of Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, all of which had East Indian-led governments at the time. And, and, and I have, you know, spoken to quite a few diplomats um, who have said to me, you know, um, that in their view, or it is a view of the international actors, that um, the, 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 the PPP is less nationalist and regionalist than the PNC, you know, and, and that people who are looking to get something out of Guyana. It's it's um they feel it's easier when the when the PPP is in office. And we can look at the way in which the PPP behaved during the 2020 election, that impasse, and the way they let in foreign actors and the way they opened only because they were interested in getting into power. And they were they were prepared to play that game and allow the thing. I've heard PPP leaders say they know that the elections that they were ultimately elected. And you ask them why and they say, because all the foreign observers said so. They, they, they don't point to the internal dynamics. There are two things they talk about, SOPs, but nobody bothers with them too much. The other justification is because the foreign actors stole them. So all they were concerned about, and remember Pompeo came here very swiftly. So this day we don't know what he signed, what they signed um, with him. Um, and so they're very wobbly on these issues. And I think the Venezuelans are keenly aware of that. And they could be pushing with something. Not the Venezuelans keep saying, 
we want to talk. We want to talk directly with um, the Guyana government. Not the Venezuelans. L listen to Mia Motley and the stance that she took. Very interesting. She's not a foolish person. At first I thought, well, uh, she was just making another statement. The more I listened to what she said, she was quite careful about how she framed the issue. What it means is that the Venezuelans are getting into the ears of our CARICOM sisters and brothers. So at that level, Venezuela, you know, is, is more than just a passing issue. And as I have said, you know, for me, this is more than just not a blade of grass. It, it is much more complex than that. I think that Calypso will be forever the anthem of Guyana's sovereignty. But we ought not to simplify its meaning to mean that all we need to do is to drop everything and say, you know, Venezuela is here. Let us bygones be bygones and let us unite and all of that kind of stuff. The, the PPP, the PPP is never going to take that stance. It's never going to take that stance. They are going to squeeze this Venezuelan thing for what it's worth for their own partisan advantage. I am very clear about that in my mind. And somebody will have to prove me wrong for me to be otherwise. So welcome. That, those are my opening remarks tonight. As I said, we're going to be talking about the myths and realities of race, ethnicity, and politics in in Guyana, because there are lots of myths about race and politics. And as I said, we have started this series last week with Vincent. You all are very enthusiastic about it. And so we are continuing it this week. Vincent is here and he's joined by, by Takuma Ogunse. Let me bring them in and let's start the conversation. Um, Takuma, good evening to you. Hi, uh, good evening, Dr. Um, Hines and your viewers. Good evening to Vincent, my colleague and fellow student. Uh, I'm not running that. Yeah, you all are both quite stretch <laughs> boys. Vincent, good evening. Good evening, good evening to yourself, viewers, and my senior, Takuma. <laughs> you know, um, the late Andaye, she would always say, you know, Guyana politics is quite interesting because she was making the point you go through the political parties and and you check the leaders they're either family they went to school together they they they, they think and um they 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 went to the same church or uh, something I mean I mean interest I mean somebody like Omowali and Hamilton Green are close cousins, right? And, 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 and you would hardly believe that during the period when the PNC and, 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 and the WB, and there's so many other instances. Um, uh, so yeah, I just learned that you guys were um, at school um, together. Uh, gentlemen, I, I want us to, to begin by looking at what I consider to be the biggest myth about race, ethnicity, and politics in Canada. And that is that we don't have a race problem. That, uh, you know, it come around election time, politicians um, harangue the people and get them to um, vote race and, 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 and act in racial. But we really don't have a racial issue in between elections. People get along uh, and, 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 and so forth. And so therefore we can solve this, 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 this race problem um, if only the politicians stop talking uh, about race. We really don't have a race problem in Guyana. I, I would like you all to address that issue. I'll start with you first, Takuma, since you have been here for a while. Um, I, I have, I have um, grown up in politics hearing that convenient kind of um, explanation by a rare 
of different people for different reasons. But anybody who honestly looked at Guyana know that the Guyana state was structured on the basis of race and racism. From the time the union, the colonizers came to the country, began to the colonization process, it was tied to them seeing themselves as superior to the Amerindians, the, the indigenous people, superior to the Africans, later the, the, the Indians. And the whole structure of the society was tied in race. And we know from the historical records that the African and Indian meeting in Guyana, our, our, our meeting together was within the context, okay, of the colonial arrangement and the colonialists brought the Indians in, okay, in order to break the bargaining power of the Africans after emancipation. And that very fact create the first <clears throat> basis for racial antagonism between Africans and Indians. So even when the PNC, the PPP, Burnham Jagon wasn't there, very early African Indian, okay, <clears throat> found themselves caught in a racial entrapment designed by the colonialists, which trigger racial feelings and create a racial crisis. And there onwards, that, that, that thing maintained. Independence aggravated because by the time we get independence, the Indians <clears throat> had a superior advantage in numbers. And since, you know, power is elections and, and, and adult suffrage and votes and so forth and so forth. And that created an open political rivalry between African Indians, apart from the economic rivalry, which was very well established. But 50 years after indenture, there was no question of the Indian economic domination of the economy of the country, facilitated you know, um, in a great way by the colonial arrangements. So it is wrong for anybody to believe that Guyana don't have a racial problem. We have a racial problem which is structured historically and we have never, as a nation, honestly faced that problem and seriously tried to correct historical injustices and the contradictions created by the colonial construct. So today, we, we, we have a serious racial problem that is worse than when I was um, began my political involvement. And this is also... Um, made worse by the presence of oil. And now we're competing not just for political power, and we're not competing for an economy that was an economy of little. Now we're competing for an economy of plenty. So we do have a profound racial problem. And to dismiss it that way is not to be serious. And I don't even think those who argue that is serious. I think they argue opportunistically to avoid having to profoundly deal and address the problem. Is there, um, before I bring in Vincent, I, I, and I note you in your very opening sentences, you said conveniently, and then you ended here that, um, that that argument is a convenient argument. So in a sense, you're saying really serious people don't believe that we don't have a problem. Um, uh, uh, and you say one of the reasons is that some people don't want to deal with the hard um, hard problem. Um, are there other reasons for that convenience, um, convenient view that is often put in the public space that we don't have a race problem? Is there, for example, political parties who feel that if you say we have a race problem, you, you alienate voters of another ethnic group, etc. Yeah, yes, I mean, we all know that both the two major parties, the, Afri the PNC and the PPP, okay, um, they took an approach, uh, and I, I don't want to add anything negative to it. I think in the circumstances, they probably genuinely felt that one of the best ways to keep the country united is to play down 
the, the, the racial uh, uh, um, contradiction. And I think that both sides, okay, in the quest for political um, um, power, contribute to a kind of opportunistic view of the question of race. And I remember when we in Ask Korea used to raise the race thing, we were being accused by both the PPP and the PNC, and maybe we were called racist. And there was not a willingness to appreciate, okay, that we were trying to grapple with a real problem in Guyana. And it's not that they didn't know there's a race problem, but the choice that they made politically. And I, I don't want to add, you know, purely negative reasons. I think the challenge to build a cohesive country out of a, a, a plantation and the racial manipulation, which we know was current in the creation by the British and the Americans and all, all of the play, the players coming up to independence, they took a certain attitude towards the, the, the issue. And I think it, it didn't really help the country. It just create an atmosphere for people to play games with this very serious and profound issue, which I think will ultimately determine in the, the, the future Guyana. Well, yes, and you, I, I think they took a pragmatic position is what you're trying to argue. But I, 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 I want to point out to you that even when Askria joined with others to become the WPA, you found that the WPA um, had a, 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 an emphasis on the instances of racial unity. I mean, Dr. Rodney's book, um, uh, uh, the history of the Guyanese working people was, was really about uh, unity between Africans and Indians. And so even the WPA took a pragmatic position to argue the, the instances of unity rather than the instances of disunity. Am I, am I mischaracterizing the WPA stance? Not, um, not really, but you have to remember that the WPA and ASCRIA and IPRA started by giving recognition to the problem. Yes. I, we I, set I, out I, to address yes, it. Yes. And we had a race commission which preceded the, 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 WP, the WPA. ASCRIA and had a race commission. We went many communities in, the, in both African and Indian communities and we discussed the problem with the people. And we came out of that commission convinced that both African and Indians want a solution to the problem. So, yes, our pragmatism on the problem was based by an open recognition of the problem. Whereas the others weren't given an open recognition of the problem, the pragmatism was That's based right. upon more convenience. Takumo going to say here, answering that, that question. Somebody's phone is going off. I am ready to bring Vincent in. Vincent, you have been talking a lot about race. Come to this for a moment. Um, been thinking a lot about race. Um, uh, and 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 uh, been working um, in a race-based organization as part of your work. Is this notion that we don't have a race problem? Is it a myth? Uh, thank, you most, thank you very much, David. Before I respond to your question, permit me the, a moment of diversions to something you uh -huh. said earlier uh, on the Venezuela issue. I just okay. thought that I should share this. It has been brought to the nation's attention that Jagu has had proffered that there was a possibility of giving Venezuela an outlet to the Atlantic yeah. as a part of the quelling <laughs> of the border uh, controversy. I just want to say that this is not a proposition. During the Chavez regime, Maduro was the Minister of Foreign Affairs and visited Guyana. And on the occasion of that visit, this matter was raised and that proposition was made. And in fact, confidentially, 
and secretly agreed to between Jagio and Maduro as the way forward. And they were doing this partly in the context of both being anti-imperialist countries, seeing the border issue in the context of a, a clash among the colonial powers. And now that they were both in the drive of an anti-colonial drive and anti-imperialist drive saying, look, we need not take on this problem that has been imposed upon us by imperial powers. But let's try to find a way to, you know, some kind of appeasement. And they agreed between Jagdio and Maduro that they would give them this way out because it also represents an interest that Venezuela has outside of anything to do with imperialism. What went wrong was that in Venezuela, this matter was leaked before it could have been formalized. And because it was leaked before it could have been formalized, it dropped off of the agenda. That is what happened. And I am sourcing this information. I would not name the person who brought it to my attention. But this information was brought to my attention on one of the occasions when I visited Venezuela as an election, an UNICER election observer. And it is officials very high in the hierarchy that in a very patriotic and neutral manner, speaking about Guyana, who brought to my attention that that proposition had been agreed to it was a question of how they would unveil it. And that before it could have been unveiled, it became public knowledge. And given the tensions in Venezuela between the government and the opposition, and in fact, sometimes that the opposition uh, takes an even harder position on this matter. And they, they, they pro West, so they wouldn't see things in the context of imperialism and anti colonial struggle that it would not have been to the benefit any longer of the Chavez regime to proceed with the proposed solution. So that we have to see the PPP and Jack you in particular as having not thought about, but actually proposing and agreeing to, given the Venezuela as an outlet to the Atlantic, as a way to appease and assuage this matter in the context of being uh, comrades in arms in struggle against uh, the imperialists. So I just thought I would share that because I don't think that we, we see it as a, a recent disclosure of a thought that Jack Dew had. It's not a thought that he had. It is something that he agreed to with Maduro, who is now president. So Maduro is well aware of where Jack Dew stood and probably stands on, on this matter. So I just thought I would put that on the table. Yes, and, and I appreciate that no, because uh, you, you know, you know it, it, um, it, it, I, I think it fits in with my own suspicion. What was, you know, uh, what is a suspicion? And now you're reinforcing that this was not something that was suggested. It was an agreement made. And so the Venezuelans, as a sense of the political pulse of the players here, um, so thanks, thanks for that, um, for that, for that um, clarification. Yeah. Mm. Now to the question before us today. The way in which Guyana has been populated, the common, the presence of the Amerindians, the coming of the Europeans into an antagonistic relationship with the Amerindians the bringing of the people of African descent into an antagonistic relationship with the Europeans and the engineering of an antagonistic relationship between the people of African descent and the Amerindians. The coming of the Portuguese, the Chinese and the Indians, all of which when they came, came into what was essentially conflictual, antagonistic, inter 
inter-race relations. So that the very foundation of the constitution of Guyana is founded on ethnic problems, uh, which are twofold. Any diverse society, ethnic diverse society, has to manage its diversity because you have a society in which you have different values at play, different cultures at play, probably different goals and aspirations at play. And so naturally, for that society to be cohesive, it has to be managed because people are coming at it from different ethnic value, religious perspectives, and that itself is a basis for conflict. And so bringing those people into one space itself provided an environment that was a potentially a conflictual environment that could be managed and therefore not have the conflict repeat itself. But we experienced a situation where not only were we diverse, but the diversity was engineered and engineered in a manner to pit one group against the other from the very inception. The Europeans pitted against the Amerindians. We know they attempted to enslave the Amerindians as well. They came, they talked about trade, and they attempted to enslave them. We know they brought the people of African descent, enslaved them, and that could never be a, a cohesive, peaceful relationship between those two ethnic groups. We know what they did with the Amerindians, calling upon them to capture uh, runaway enslaved persons, and that in instances, the Amerindians actually brought body parts as, as evidence if they had not captured, so to speak, that they had gotten rid of yet another uh, enslaved person who had sought to free himself. So our, our, our country is built on natural inter-ethnic differences, and it's also built on engineered inter-ethnic differences. And one may contend that in latter days, latter days, the politicians in their own interest sought to take advantage of their ethnic allegiance for the purpose of the acquisition and the maintenance of power. So that anyone who says we don't have an ethnic problem does not understand the manner in which this country was conquered, so to speak, settled, uh, the manner in which it was populated, because all of that itself is the basis or was, is the basis for the kind of antagonisms across the ethnic divide. What happened in the process of post-emancipation, the way in which uh, the Chinese were brought, the way in which the Portuguese were brought, the way in which the Indians were brought, the differentiation that took place when they were brought, and the stereotyping as a part of the engineering that occurred really created a landscape of ethnic conflict. And so sometimes the ethnic conflict might have been latent, latent, but circumstances would cause an eruption. It's like a volcano. Kayana is a volcano, right? That erupts from time to time based on the issues, whether they are political, economical, and other social uh, issues. And, and really, this is a matter I've paid some attention to. And you, you mentioned the other day, um, discovering one of my writings. I yes. sought to address this question in a piece that I have in my hand, which was a part of the IDS uh, IDS uh, working papers, working paper number five of IDS. 
And the topic here that I used was Guyanese political culture through the prism of race and class, the prism of race and class, where I sought to show that from time to time, one became more dominant over the other, but that both of those elements, race and class, are at play in the conflictual nature of, of our society, but that historically you had an injection which was both race and class simultaneously enslaved people's plantation owners class. Enslaved people being people of African descent, plantation owners being Europeans. Race. So simultaneously we've had this uh, development of a nation based on race and class. Natural problems of race and class, natural problems, and the engineered problems of race and class. And so anyone who says that there's no such problem really doesn't understand the case of Guyana. And I dare say, that the politicians who have repeatedly contended that there isn't such a problem, really have content project of nation building without uh, themselves being grounded in an understanding of the issues of recent class, but that they also would have tried to gain legitimacy as the rulers or the government. You see, it is one thing to say you're elected, but elections are not necessarily always the source of legitimacy. But if you're elected, but you have a significant part of society that continues to reject you, your legitimacy as the government of all, the government of all, legitimacy is about all, it's not about just being elected. Your legitimacy can be questioned. And so as a part of ensuring that they, they, they project themselves as being illiterate, uh, legitimate and uh, giving credence to that, they take the position that there is no problem between the groups. We in fact embrace all, have the support of all, and therefore are uh, legitimate. And so if one invest against the history of ethnic relations, apart from the periods in the 60s when one could not suppress the conflict. Very often, ethnic conflict has been suppressed with the instances of ethnic conflict where uh, one ethnic group uh, targets the army because they are people of African descent and the, the, the quarantine matter comes to mind where one person was charged uh, uh, for killing an, uh, an African Guyanese soldier. And there were many other instances where there was ethnic conflict that led to assassinations and things like that, that were suppressed because if they were made to be known, then there would be the basis for questioning legitimacy of the current of the of the current government of that time, and so we suppress them to help to uh, argue that they were not only elected but legitimate. And I think the question of legitimacy, probably not now, is one that we have to uh, look at as well, because the issues we have, our electoral issues, and the moments after, are not merely electoral issues. The issues of legitimacy of our government. Legitimacy of our government, quite a lot there in the first part of the program. I want to pose a direct question to the two of you because it is a question that keeps coming up um, implicitly and explicitly. We know we have a winner-take-all form of government. 
that one party wins and it governs. And often that party is of one of the two major ethnic groups, whether it's the PNC and Africans or the PPP and, and, and Indians. And um, when, the when the party is elected, the party then purports to speak for all the ethnic groups in Guyana and to represent their interests um, uh, without the involvement of their own representatives. The question I'm putting to you, put to you all, can, um, can East Indian leaders, Indian Guyanese leaders, speak for African Guyanese? And can they reasonably govern in the interests of all Guyanese in an equitable way? So first of all, can African leaders speak for Indians and Indian leaders speak for Africans? And secondly, when an African dominated organization or an Indian dominated party, I mean, get into power, can they reasonably govern without the involvement of the elected representatives of those groups? Takumo Gonsi, I'll start with you for it. Start it doesn't mean for me as a straightforward issue. Our experience in the last second 70 years or 65 years, right? I, 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 my head is not working quickly on the maths. I've demonstrated that it can work. And I don't know after all of that, all, all, all of that time, we, we, we're going to play games with it. The winner take all system just can't work in our situation. Africans does not accept Indians have the right to speak for them. Uh, Indian doesn't accept that Africans have the right to speak for them. And Africans don't believe that Indians could govern, govern the country in a just way to look after their, their interests. <clears throat> Indians don't believe that Africans could govern the country in a just way to look after their interests. And let me stop playing games. That is the reality I've been facing us uh, um, uh, 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 for a very long time. And we have, to we have to face these realities. We have failed to create the political environment and I, I don't think when I say we have failed I mean collectively and I don't know since we come out of a colonial structure and since we, we you know <coughs> we weren't our own masters very very up to recently and even up to now we are not our own masters given the new colonial arrangements in, uh, in the world I don't know we could continue to fool ourselves that the political construct that we have is adequate to satisfy the interests of all the ethnic groups in all racial or ethnic groups in Guyana. I think it's a non-issue in, in a sense is whether or, or not the, the, the system could work. We know the system can't work. And I don't know why we should continue to play games on it. And every all politicians or social thinkers who believe that the system could work. They're lying, they're, they're, they're hypocrites, they're dishonest. You know, we reach a point where we, we have to stop this thing and we have to refashion the governance system that allows each race to feel that they have, not only to feel, to know that they have their representatives at the table and that their interests as they define it is being put in the basket and at, at the end of the day what come out reflects our collective ethnic interests all ethnic groups what the Amerindians, how, how how the present system could give justice to the indigenous people you know you, and the, you, if you were to go by the politics on the basis of numbers that's a eurocentric construct of governance based upon numbers there's no way the Amerindians in, in any hurry will be any political position to, you know, you know, win power in Guyana. Therefore, you're going to exclude them perpetually. We have to we have to recognize the limitations of the, of the system as not being effective enough to address the ethnic concerns of our or the racial concerns of the various racial groups in Guyana. It can't work. It has failed. It has to be changed. I don't know, you know, we have anything to gain by continuing, you know, to fool ourselves that, you know, it is not so. 
Let, let me ask you an attendant question, Takumo, uh, before I go over to Vincent. And I would like Vincent to answer that question because Vincent has some a nuanced view of, 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 of the, um, the question that I am uh, going to raise. Can Africans in the PPP speak for African Guyanese? Do they speak for African Guyanese? Can Indians in the PNC speak for Indian Guyanese? And do they speak for Indian Guyanese? Does Takuma Ogunse of the WPA um, speak for Indians? Can he speak for Indians, represent Indians' issue? Can uh, uh, um, Aganish Mahai Paul in the PNC speak for Indians? Can Mark Phillips and uh, Bishop Juan Ejil speak for Africans? Takuma, I'll, I'll, I'll have, have you take a for shot. Oh, then... yeah, given, the, given the evolution and the construct of our political parties, in a real way, um, those, per, the, the, those persons who from one ethnic group go over to the other party, they don't really, not that they can't speak, you, you, you could talk. But if speaking is more than just talking, and that is why I'm speaking saying, means do that they, you, do you, do you do effective they, enough yes. to change and influence policies. I will say on fundamental issues, no. On matters where it doesn't matter, probably yes. If, if, if the matter is whether Africa should get a party here or a party there, I think Phillips and them could say, you know, uh, they put the party X place. Party, oh, yes, in, a, party in a sport. Yeah. yeah huh? Party, you mean party as in a dance? A party. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You see, but when it comes to fundamental issues, whether the PPP government will operate on the principle that the oil money must be used to correct historical injustices in the country, and we should use it to, uh, 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 to build <clears throat> the possibility of economic parity among our people to guarantee um, oneness and cohesion. Those are fundamental issues. No black person <laughs> in the PPP will get around on, on that. And I, I will argue in the PNC days, if an Indian seriously challenge the PNC on rig elections, okay, um, they're not going to survive because you're not going to survive. So I will say, I will say no. But um, I don't want to say that our both of our parties are so rigid and so uncivilized that they don't facilitate some level of discourse by people of other races among the ranks in politics in general. But it is done in a political culture and a party culture where you know your place. Vincent Alexander? Uh, you have about three questions there to address. <laughs> yes, I, I want to introduce two terms <laughs> in addressing this question. Sympathy and empathy. Sorry, Vincent, just repeat. Sympathy, sympathy and empathy. Okay. Uh -huh. Two terms, sympathy and empathy. Given the way in which our society has evolved, the ethnic groups from the standpoint of self-interest, based on where they've been located in the society, the political economy of the society, etc., sometimes could hardly sympathize with the other. Can hardly sympathize. They're looking after their own interests. And because of the differences, the diversity, the differences, there isn't necessarily the understanding of the other group in a manner that allows them to sympathize, particularly when they are in competition among themselves. So they can't sympathize. Worse yet, they can't empathize. Because sympathy means that you, you have some understanding and you're sorry for it. And you want to give comfort to. But empathy means that you have the same experience. You're wearing the same shoes, so to speak. 
And therefore, when you speak to the issue, you speak into the issue from an experiential perspective as if it's affecting you. And given where we are located, we cannot empathize. We don't wear the same shoes. We don't have the same experiences. And therefore, we do not have the kind of background that allows for us easily to come to the same position on issues because we have different interests that doesn't allow for sympathy. We don't have the same experience that allows for empathy and therefore we are naturally dislocated. And any working together has to be a conscious process because the processes of sympathy and empathy aren't necessarily conscious processes. They are not natural processes based on the reality of our being and our existence and things like that. Working together has to be a conscious process. All right, having said what I said about sympathy and empathy, I'll however point to the instances where from a class perspective, we were able to emphasize, to emphasize and to sympathize in the first instance, and to emphasize to some extent in the second instance. And therefore, if you check our history, you see moments when the two ethnic groups work together from a class perspective because the class perspective lent to some degree of sympathy and to some degree of empathy. And I often contend that if one looks at the period of the where the WPA was in its heyday, that to a very large extent, the heyday was surrounded around class issues, economic issues economic circumstances of those days allowed for the people of African descent and for the people of Indian descent to sympathize and to some extent even to empathize with each other and therefore under the leadership of the WP were able to work together. But, but, but once those economic issues were not the ascending issue. And for example, the political issue became the ascending issue. Then we saw that the, the empathy and, and, and sympathy was swept away by the ethnic problem where there was no sympathy and no empathy. And that speaks, for example, to the results of the 1992 elections. The 1992 elections where the 10% PNC was able to gain 40 something percent of the votes. And the popular WPA that mobilized both groups against the border regime receded probably to single figures in terms of the uh, electoral results. Yeah, two, two to so three percent. What? <laughs> huh? two, two to three percent. Right. So what is required really uh, is a conscious leadership that seeks to do an analysis of the problem and to give leadership based on that analysis uh, of the problem. And my own disposition in the PNC was that if you want to be a national party, when you have Indian brothers and sisters come to the party, they must come with a clear understanding that they are coming to express the concerns of the people of Indian descent. And that they must openly express those concerns and that they be able to go back to the Indian community and clearly say to them, we are articulating your concerns. And that the party was then have the Indians throw up what they think are solutions for the problems that are confronted by people of Indian descent. And have the Africans throw up what solutions for the people of African descent and see how we can find some 
common ground in terms of addressing those problems that affect the various groups, even as we address problems which are national problems and are common to both the people of African descent, Indian descent, Amerindians, and, and others. So that whilst I think that the natural state does not facilitate the kind of imposition of one party on, this, on, on, on the state, that if there is a conscious effort based on a scientific understanding of our reality to bring together a party that in a sense represents what we call in for the level of governance, a party that consciously says, hey, we are in a situation where it's not a monolithic society. We have representatives, representatives of both all groups here. They bring into the table their issues. We prepare to objectively try to address those issues. Then the party can attain some status as, as a national party. And a party like that may well conclude that beyond the party itself, in governance, we have to have a similar structure and a similar disposition if we're going to have a cohesive uh, society. So I think that there is the absence of, on one hand, I don't think that we have had the depth of uh, analysis, the depth of study, the depth of understanding, the depth of conversation about your reality. And as a consequence of that, uh, the society is still operating on how it has evolved uh, naturally and how it has been engineered by the uh, colonizers and is not benefited from a conscious approach to a problem which has been intellectualized. Uh, in, in the Caribbean, we have had various people who have sought to intellectualize in this problem, whether it was the economist, what's his name, former chancellor of the University of Guyana from St. Lucia, you remind me of his name, whether it's Braffweed, Arthur Lewis, Braffweed, Arthur Lewis whether it's Braffweed, these guys have uh, intellectualized. Smith. Smith. GM Smith, all of these guys have, have intellectualized in this problem and they have looked to other societies, uh, how they have sought to address the problem. Malaysia is one society that they often uh, look to in terms of how the problem has been resolved. Fiji's society they've looked to is how the problem has evolved rather than resolved. We have refused at the political level to benefit from the rich uh, research, the rich intellectual material that's available, and if utilized, can help us to resolve this problem. We refuse to do it. We refuse to do it, I think, largely in, in uh, elite interests, interests of the elite of the various groups. And so in some regards, again, and there's a class intervention uh, taking place in, 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 in that regard. But we must recognize that our society has to be analyzed from an ethnic and class perspective. That at the end of the day in our society, uh, the ethnic may be the determining factor. From time to time, class may be a dominating factor. But as the ethnic is a determining factor, you can see that the ethnicity, ethnic problem is also built on the economic structures of our society. So that that is what allows from time to time for the class to intervene and to become a dominant factor. But essentially, the ethnic factor, our circumstance, is a pervasive and perennial uh, factor with class sometimes dominating based on the environment on which, in which things are unfolded. Um, Vincent, you've taken us into the realm of race and class, and, and that's where I'm going to go next, because we have a unique society. Our elites are probably unique in all of the countries of the world. Our political elites from independence to the present have generally been left of center, 
openly Marxist. Some call themselves communists, some call themselves socialists, some call themselves Marxists. I always say in the 1970s and 80s, the PPP was communist, call itself communist. The PNC called itself Marxist, Leninist, socialist. The WPA called itself independent Marxist. Nowhere in the world would you have the three major political parties at a particular time openly referring to themselves. And this is during the Cold War. So Guyana is very unique. So when you raise the point of race and class, it takes us in a, at a particular place. Ogun say, I want you to listen to something that Vincent has had to listen to on more than one occasion and responded to. And I want to get your response to it at the other end, um, Takuma. But at the same time, we can maintain our cultural uh, values and cultural links. Um, and I've pointed out the problem that I see, you know, that is connected uh, to the Indian community. Um, Guyana is unique. I, I don't know if it's an aberration, but when you look at Guyanese society from the 50s and so on, uh, you have had three major organizations, all of them Marxist oriented, right? Um, but in terms of Marxist ideology, even within that ideology, there were also distinctions that had to be made. Um, for instance, uh, the Marxism that was practiced or envisioned by the PPP was more, in a sense, um, you know, more aligned and connected uh, with Soviet communism. Um, and in a sense, I think to a large extent, uh, you can make the argument looking at the PPP um, and looking at uh, the Jagans and what they have done, uh, that they were more concerned, not necessarily about articulating that Indian concern. In fact, I, I've written something about this, um, about how, you know, there was to a certain extent, um, a sort of a marginalization of that Indian cultural value uh, from the perspective of the PPP, and I've gotten some serious backlash from people like Clement Rohi, um, you know, and uh, Dana Ramatar. Keep in mind, these are not individuals who have a strong history of speaking out on behalf of Indians. Uh, now, Chetty was a great person. You know, he was one of a kind. You'll never have some, someone like him again. But if you look at Chetty's philosophy, um, and you compare that to, let's say, Walter Rodney or UC Kwayana, Right or Andy, you see a distinction here in terms of uh, an understanding of Marxism. Uh, and the distinction here, and this is important for us to understand, especially where the WPA is concerned, is that when you look at the, the mind of Walter Rodney and the things he has written about, you look at the work of UC Kwayana, there is a strong understanding a very strong understanding of who they were as Africans. And I think to a large extent, uh, we can agree that yes, Africans have lost a lot of their cultural values, but in terms of the unanimity of thinking, of understanding who they are as Africans, I think they are far more advanced in that perspective. I'll give you a simple example. If you were to ask Walter Rodney how he would define himself, for him, nationality and cultural identity is very complex. He would most likely say, I am an African, right? I am a Guyanese, I am a person from the Caribbean, among other things. So he sees that cultural and that global link. We don't have that. So when uh, Kimani talks about, yes, you know, there was an attempt to go out there and work among the people, um, the assumption is being made that, yes, people understand who they were when they were going out into the community. But that distinction, even in I, the ideological perspective, was different. So you don't have that there. So the WPA, in a sense, emerged as an organization that was very embedded in the African culture in the 1970s. Right? And again, this was not something you can attribute to the PPP. Right? In the 1970s, uh, there were a lot of radical blacks from Africa, from the United States, who were invited by Kwayana and Forbes into Guyana, right? And, and some of these folks would have argued that Shetty was a racist. And we know that, I mean, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to make that argument. 
but my simple point is that you don't have that. Uh, and here's my evidence. You can have a person like um, Mr. Phillips, for instance, right, or the commissioner of police talk about, you know, being proud as being an African. Where do we see those Indians who will be willing to make those kinds of statements and feel comfortable making those statements, right? So Walter was very deeply embedded in his culture. He understood that, but he was a Marxist, right? To me, that's an extension, a much more uh, complex understanding of who he was compared to the, the very rigid um, ideological perspective that you had with the, with the PPP, right? Now, there are some distinctions here again. Takuma, um, is Betaram Ramarak onto something and is he silencing something? Talk to us about what you heard there. <laughs> okay, first and foremost, I think that he and his Indian colleagues are the best person, persons to determine whether Chedi, Marxism, made him silent on Indian, his Indian um, cultural background, they are the best to make that judgment. I, I will engage it, okay, from where I am, and I will argue that Dr. Jagon, it is true that Dr. Jagon accepted a conventional view of Marxism, which ties him to political allegiance with the Soviet Union and so forth and so forth. And, for, and he placed greater emphasis on that, okay, than the cultural um, aspects of things. But I think that you have to recognize that Chedi was doing that in a situation where there was Indian cohesiveness behind the PPP as Indians. There, 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 there were no significant fight in the PPP Indian community about Marxism. The, the PPP was a unique Marxism. I think we've lost. So yes, Chedi right. didn't have the burden. Okay, didn't have the burden. Okay, or, or he could have he could afford. Okay, not to, to emphasize his cultural um, ethnicity because he was operating in a system of the people who have that intact, in who understood that the PPP, okay, was representing that and the PPP understood that. Now, in the, in the African case, from the start in our history, us to reclaim our identity, cultural identity, as part of regaining our, our humanity. Indians and in, in, Indians as a community and the Indian leaders, they weren't stripped of their culture. So they were under pressure to reclaim the identity, the cultural identity. They already had that intact. And apart from our politics, we had to re reclaim our identity, okay, as part of reclaiming our humanity as a people who are enslaved and stripped of everything. So that become almost a, a, a equally important part of our worldview as our approach to Marxism. And we saw Marxism as a tool, okay? A theoretical tool like you, any other scientific tool in chemistry and uh, um, physics. Okay, so that was our, our approach, and we understood that at the end of the day, Marxism is not necessarily your political alliances in the global space. The test there, there's a lot of people who were aligned with the Soviet Union and the Cubans who were Marxists. So Marx aligning with the Soviet Union or, or, or Cuba 
or China doesn't automatically make you a Marxist or give you greater Marxist credential in a profound way. The test is whether you are applying to your political reality as far as practically possible the Marxist science. And that is where that was our line of uh, line of thinking. And that's why we call ourselves uh, independent Marxist um, um, thinkers. While we accept it as a useful tool, we don't we didn't treat Marx as a Bible. Okay. So I would say that, he, that yes, the WPA in the 70s, and I I, 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 I was listening to him very carefully because sometimes <laughs> Once you keep the, 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 the analysis to persons that he points to, okay, his articulation, okay, about the WP um, people becomes more accurate. But if you were to... We're having some bandwidth problems, it seems there. You, then, 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 you, then, then you're different. The point I'm trying to make, we, I declare, we declare an Ascro Africanist. But a lot of the African masses had problems with, with embracing Africanists. It's a hell of a struggle. So, so, I have, so, but the Chedi and the Indians, they had the problem. So, the point I'm trying to say, yes, the people who we point, and Dye Walter Eusi, okay, had arrived at that point. But but if you're going to move it to mean that the entire the African community or a wide perspective of the African community had also arrived to that point, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not saying he's saying that, but I'm I'm saying that when I listen to him, I get a a, 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 a slight impression that he's trying to extend it beyond the four individuals he point out. Yeah. All right, Takumo Gonset. Vincent, you had not um, addressed this aspect of Beethoven's thing, the whole question that African Marxists um, inculcate, um, uh, integrate into their analysis race, what you call it race and class. And that for Indian Marxists, they deal strictly with class. Um, <laughs> talk to that. First of all, let me say that to a very large extent, uh, Dr. Jigan and his um, protégés were dogmatists, in my view, and not Marxists from the standpoint, partly what Ugunsia says, that those of us who see Marxism as a tool, we see Marxism as being, in some regards, diagnostic. They saw Marxism as being uh, prescriptive. In fact, we should not call them Marxists. We should call them communists. Because beyond Marxism, beyond Marxism, in the Eastern Doc, they developed the concept of, um, they went beyond political economy, they went beyond the philosophy, and they developed a Marx, a prescription. There's a term for it, even failing in these terms these days. They developed a prescription. There are those of us who are involved in Marxism who use the political economy and the philosophy, dialectical materialism, as a tool for analysis to determine you know, what solutions one should come up with. Even the PVP did not use Marxism as a tool for analysis. They accepted the prescription of the Eastern Bloc and therefore were not relating to our reality with their Marxism, except that Except that, given the structure of the indo guyanese community, where on one hand, they are of one in so far as their outlook is informed by Hinduism. Mm -hmm. and 
that Bitram doesn't seem to want to accept. It's informed mm -hmm. by Hinduism. So they were at one in terms of the world outlook in some regards. They were at one. That world outlook accepts hierarchy. It accepts hierarchy. And because it accepts hierarchy, it allowed a party that professed to be Marxist that did not rep objectively represent their interests to impose itself upon them because having accepted Chedi as a top dog, then the system of hierarchy fell into place and they then marched behind the leader. And so whilst there was no synergy, classical synergy between Hinduism and Marxism, there was a synergy in so far as the attitudinal issues allowed for Hindus not to compete from the ideological perspective with the Marxist thoughts. Given the fact that also what Marxism applied by the PVP did created an ethnic divide. Because the PVP emphasized the role of the working class. And though, in my view, sugar workers are not typically working class people, they sought to contend that the people in the sugar industry and the farmers were the real workers. A very um, simple definition. Of, of the working class. They were the workers. And that people in the public service were petty bourgeois, bourgeoisies and parasitic. That they were living off of the back of the people who were doing the real production. So that even in their applications of Marxism, in a very subtle way, there was the ethnic element. Because you know, I asked Chedi on one occasion when he came to Moscow, why is it on a particular occasion in a national election, national and regional elections, the PVP did not contest in Region 10? I asked Chedi that question. And I suggested to him in asking that question that the real working class in Guyana were the bauxite workers because they had no alternative to selling their labor. Sugar workers always had an alternative to selling their labor in so far as they had, they were involved in some peasant activities, gardening and things like that. They could strike and, and, and sustain the strike because they could go and pick fruits and pick food in the, in, in, in the backyard. The sugar, the, the bauxite worker, when he strike, he has deprived himself of all that he had to maintain. So that they are the real workers. But still, the way the PVP operated was to suggest by their articulation that the Indians were the real workers. They didn't use the word Indian, the sugar workers. Sugar workers. In these days, they tell us that we, we have a debt of gratitude to the sugar workers. That's why, although sugar is not profitable, we must still. Um, we must still uh, keep the industry so going. You have a bit of gratitude to the working class that has kept this economy economy going. So that my first point, sorry for being kind of elongated, the PVP is not a real Marxist party. They are a communist party and went beyond the tools, the two tools of Marxism, that is the philosophy, the dialectical and material, uh, dialectical materialism and the political economy to accept uh, the prescriptions of the East. But in accepting the prescriptions of the East, they were applying them in a society where because of the nature of their constituency, the Hindus, there was no issue of being contested 
because Hindus accepted the whole question of hierarchy and Chedi was virtually a deity. And so you follow, the, he's a deity of the day. Hinduism is about deities of the day. Chedi could virtually be a god. And I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious here. No. The man no. who rescues his society at a particular time, if you look at the Hindu tradition, that's how they derive their gods. <laughs> and so Chedi could virtually be a god. So that's the first point I want to make, that they were not real, real Marxists, but that there was uh, a convoluted situation in terms of Marxism and Hinduism that allowed for a so-called Marxist party to maintain its control over a constituency really based on Hinduism. And the point that Ogins Gugunse made is a critical point. African Guyanese have been trying to retain their identity and have formed all sorts of organizations to do so. They told Bitteram, Indians don't have to do that. That Hindu religion as an institution has kept them with their identity from the time of arrival to present time. And so even in the circumstances where we have uh, the PPP moving in the direction of neoliberalism, the Indian of the lower class are trapped under the leadership of the, of the upper class in a manner that does not allow them to come out against clear exploitation and discrimination against them because of the nature of the society that, that their society, the nature of their community. So I, I think we have to see it, and the African Guyanese is quite different. And here again, we're talking about the diversity. We're talking about being able to sympathize. We're talking about being able to empathize. We are different people who can find commonality in a single place uh, that can take us forward. And an element of the commonality has to be the acceptance of diversity. We have to be able to, to, to let diversity prevail the level of the individual, at the level of the family, at the level of the community, and then to find the things that are common at the national level that create the cohesion, ensuring that the diversity as is manifest at the individual, family, and communal level is not in conflict with national interests. So national interests protects that diversity. Diversity doesn't conflict with national interests, but we are able to have our separate uh, identities uh, as subgroups of one identity called, called uh, a, a Guyanese. And I think we have to see our society from that perspective. Bethlehem does not do that. Bethlehem is looking for um, Indo-Guyanese to behave like Afro-Guyanese when they don't wear the same shoes. They don't have the same problem. Yeah. I would argue, as opposed to Beit Ram, if you check literature written about Guyana, that Indo-Guyanese have done much more writing from an Indo-Guyanese perspective than Afro-Guyanese have done from an Afro-Guyanese perspective. But the Indo-Guyanese have not had to step into the political arena mm -hmm. to contest the status quo. Because the status quo facilitates their being. Our status quo, the national status quo, did not facilitate the African being from the inception. And the African struggle is to retain his being in an alien place, in a foreign place. Vincent Alexander Takumo. Vincent, are you finished? Yes, I. I, I Right. Um, Vincent Alexander Tukumo is going to say quite a lot tonight. And, and I think this last um point has not been um has not has not has not been exhausted. Um uh, uh, but you all I think have given us a lot to work with. I mean the, the society, our society at, at large, sometimes have problems with African Guyanese scholars and artists and politicians 
having to deal with the question of race. So many of us have been called racist, you know, because the society has to deal with us um, always, whatever we do, whether we are writing books, we are doing science, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are farmers, whatever we do, the question of race is clear and present, and it has to do with that unique history of Africans, and that Indians deal with race, as Vincent has pointed out, and has written a lot about race from an Indian perspective. But as you're right, what these fellows want is perhaps for them to be as vocal as we are on the issues of the United Nations, I said, that despite all the changes that have been made since independence, that the condition of African Guyanese vis-a-vis equitable access to resources is still a problem. And that as African scholars and leaders and thinkers, we are grappling with that. And they said that years after indentureship, Indians are still grappling with something. Indians would have had to uh, engage that issue. And so therefore, um, I think you all have brought some and not some, a lot of clarity to um, some of these issues. It is not because Vincent Alexander or Gunse or Nigel Hughes or Eric Phillips are racist, or as my friend Ravi like to say, we got race on our brain. <laughs> race follows us wherever we go <laughs> because the whole notion and concept of race was created in order to enslave us. Vincent, and you, you trying to say something? No, 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 no. no. You, you, right. And so, it, 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 but thanks very much for clarifying for us, and I'm sure the audience will have a better sense um, of uh, how we engage these issues. As we said, Thursday is our race, ethnicity, and politics day. We come back again next Thursday when we um, continue this conversation. Vincent, Takuma, thank you all so much for coming on and see you all next Thursday. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm leaving. Good night to you, viewers. And thank you all for staying with us. We have gone over um, by half an hour. Um, my, my apologies to, um, to uh, Mr. Duncan, but he, he will understand. Um, and, and my thanks to you all for staying with us tomorrow night. We are going to be talking about Venezuela and policy. Um, Dr. Professor um, Mark Curtin is going to be here, is making his first appearance on Politics 101. We're going to look deeper into Venezuela and the Venezuelan uh, Guyana border issues. See you all tomorrow night.